Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. This is the weekend edition where we interview notable people from the world of real estate investing. Today is no exception. We've got a great guest all the way from Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Welcome to the show, Ryan Webster. Thanks for having me, Victor. Great to have you here. Now, Ryan, you have a background in construction, but today you're doing strictly value add. Before we dive into the details, maybe give us a little bit of your backstory and how you got to this point in your journey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, prior to kind of doing multifamily acquisitions, I owned and operated a construction development company here in the Midwest uh, about two years ago, founded Equity Yield Group, my partner Warren, um, and now we focus exclusively on acquisitions of A and B class, institutional quality, multifamily assets, well located in strong markets across the Southeast. And we look for a light to moderate value add component. Fascinating. From my perspective, that's a segment of the market that has been perhaps one of the hottest segments. Anytime a property comes on the market, it's usually an auction with multiple offers and prices are through the roof. How have you managed to acquire and not pay too much? Yeah, um, it is difficult right now. Um, and we've, we're very specific in our, in our criteria and what makes a, a good investment for us. Um, we have a very low strike ratio. So we may look at three, 400 deals to end up buying three to four. And the bidding, competitive bidding process, even in the last year has changed considerably. We've gone from best and final rounds of used to be, you know, you'd have three, maybe five. I mean, some of the hotter markets we're seeing multiple best and final, best and final, final, best and final, final. Um, and pricing guidance has gotten to the point where it, it's really irrelevant at CFO. Um, it's the broker's best guess. And it ultimately, these properties end up trading for millions of dollars above initial guidance. But for us, we're really focused on the fundamentals of where is that property located? What are the economic drivers around that location? Because at the end of the day, you're buying a business that happens to be located in a property and come with some buildings attached to it. So you really need some focus on what are the fundamentals of that business? What is driving that rent growth? Is it sustainable? Is it realistic? I agree with that so strongly. That makes a lot of sense. So how do you make those determinations? I mean, obviously, real estate is all about location, location, location. And the last two years have been unusual to say the least. How do you take the data from the last couple of years and project forward? Or do you go back to 2019 and, bef and be before? Yeah. I mean, obviously gazing into the crystal ball and trying to predict uh, future conditions is the hardest part of, of the job here. But for us, kind of looking at what is sustainable rent growth, especially when we've seen double digit rent growth in a lot of the major metros lately. Um, and we're asking, okay, is this, is this sustainable? Is this realistic? Are rents going to plateau or are they going to come back down? And for us, it comes down to really two things, supply and demand of, of housing. Obviously, demand for housing is very huge, but we look for areas that are not only supply constrained, but are have you know, higher barriers to entry of, of new product in the area. Um, and then affordability. And this is a component we've been looking into increasingly because that's the next thing that's going to bring rents down. Um, whether rents actually come down or whether you see a problem with collections and you're not collecting the rents that you're charging, um, especially with you know inflation eating away at people's wages. We started to look at pre-qualifying tenants income at renewal of leases and at new leases. So income to rent ratios in a given market and more importantly, income to rent ratios on the property itself um, are a very important indicator of what is really sustainable for rent levels in that area and on the property. When you acquire a rental property, especially in areas that are, let's say, more of those sun destinations in the southeast along the Gulf Coast, which I think is where you play, you could potentially focus on different segments of the market. You could focus on people that can't afford necessarily to own a property in that particular area, so they rent. You could focus on folks that maybe live a good chunk of the year Perhaps in an expensive market in the Northeast, you might think of some New York accents showing up in the area, or maybe some other segment, maybe folks that are retiring, they don't want to tie up equity in a property and they'd rather live off of their equity and use that, use that nest egg to pay rental income. Have you decided to focus on a particular segment or is it just open to all market comers? 
Yeah. So what we see on our properties kind of uh, in and around Tampa is a good mix of, of all that. Um, a lot of it driven by obviously migration um, down to the Sun Belt. You have, you know, your snowbirds that have been down every year who are deciding, okay, you know, we're, we're not going back this year. We're just going to stay here. You know, historically rented, you know, throughout part of the season that are now just continuing to rent. You have people who have moved there for jobs or a lot of people who live up north where I do are tired of uh, the cold here said, you know what, I'm no longer tied to my desk. I'm going to go ahead and make the move and, and go live near the beach. So a lot of our tenants, you know, there's a lack of homes and affordable homes in the area. So a lot of them are continuing to rent. And especially as rates come up, I think uh, a lot of individuals who may have been planning to purchase a home in the near future are now being priced out of the market. So they will continue to rent. Um, and we have a lot of people who are moving down, looking for a home that are in transition, who are renting short term, maybe renting a little longer term. Um, and then we have a lot of people who just choose to rent. Um, there's a lot more community amenities on the properties than you'd have. Uh, you don't have the maintenance and upkeep that you would have of home ownership. And we see a lot of that with the retirees that are moving down there or live down there. It's just a, really a lifestyle thing for them. Absolutely. The question of affordability is one that you look at the local market, you look at incomes, and you try and wrap your mind around, well, how is it that people are coming into the market, rents keep going up, and it keeps going up and up and up beyond what you would think is sustainable. But then you've got people moving, say, from Manhattan, where maybe they were renting for 7000 a month, or maybe they had a condo and they're paying 2500 or 3000 a month in condo fees because the building's got a, a doorman and a concierge and it just happened to be in an expensive area. Now they can rent for less than their condo fee and put the rest of the change in their pocket. So the question of affordability is it's a little bit in the eye of the beholder, is it not? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Affordability is uh, relative and we see a lot of people we know have moved from the Northeast. Uh, we see a lot of people who have you know, moved from California, have moved from Phoenix. Um, and even though we've seen rent growth you know, in excess of, of 30% on some of our properties, um, and they come and move in and go, wow, this, this is $1,200 cheaper than I was paying where I came from. Exactly. So where, I guess the question is, where's the ceiling or is there one? Um, again, I, I think it, it really comes down to supply and demand. Um, if the supply of housing catches up to meet or exceed demand. We're going to see, you know, a lot of concessions. We're going to see vacancy come back up, and then affordability. Again, like you said, it's relative to you know what your income is and what you're used to for cost of living and, and where you're from. But as long as we're staying below that affordability ceiling, I think rents will continue to come up. Obviously, you know, twenty thirty percent is not sustainable, you know, long term. Which we typically, when we're projecting forward, we depending on where we are on a location, it's really kind of a, a two to 5% annual organic rent growth. And then we have, you know, a value add premium for renovated units. If I think about the wake of the financial crisis and that started in 2007, 2008, we saw significant reduction in value when there was obviously lending really disappeared for the most part for a period of time. Counties like Miami-Dade County, Broward County, all along the Gulf Coast of Florida, many of those markets were absolutely hammered, in part because in moments of financial stress, many of these places were second homes, and people would rather protect the homestead and let the second property go if they needed to, uh, you know, protect the homestead above all else. How many of these properties are second homes for people, and is that a risk that you might see going forward? We don't really see that uh, much in the large multifamily space. This is mostly the primary residence of these people. I think, you know, when you get into vacation homes and, and condos and, and second home for single family, I think there is a lot of exposure there. But as far as multifamily go, this is uh, where these residents live. That makes a lot of sense. Before we started recording, we were talking a little bit about risk management and making sure that you've got some of the best risk adjusted returns. What are the risks that you see going forward? I mean, obviously, the headlines are all about armed conflict in Europe and, and all the rest. That's obviously got to play a role. But even if you put that aside, where do you see the risks? Yeah, um, you know, back to kind of when I switched from construction development into stabilized multifamily acquisitions, it really comes down to does it cash flow? Does it cash flow day one? Does it have the opportunity to produce cash flow? I think that's really the indicator of do you have an investment of 
real value um, that's going to mitigate risk. Obviously, values of real estate go up and down, but that's, for the most part, really irrelevant until the day you decide to sell, as long as you have something that's stable and, and cash flowing. The other risk that we're seeing and you know we're taking a lot of mind to is, is the debt market. You know, we knew rates were coming up. We've known rates were going to have to come back up uh, when they went down. And, you know, most deals that got executed last year were executed with some sort of debt fund, you know, bridge debt uh, on a variable rate product. And just as far as getting the leverage and the pricing that you needed to compete and get deals to generate yield last year, that was really the debt product that, that you had to go with. So a lot of our deals did get executed with debt funds, but we took a strategy to purchase you know, very aggressive rate caps. Um, so we buy 50 basis point rate caps for three years on our variable rate debt. And we're getting ready to refinance out a couple of those deals and move into fixed rate debt. And what we've seen is you know, the value of those rate caps have actually increased. So one of those, we've got two years left on the rate cap. We're getting ready to refinance in the fixed rate debt. We don't need the rate cap anymore. So we're taking that back to market and, and selling it for $500,000 premium to what we paid for it a year ago. Wow. Obviously, yes, anyone who's paying attention recognizes that interest rates are headed north, not because there necessarily needs to be a rate increase to fight inflation, which is a very popular narrative at the moment, but there's clearly a risk premium that's being applied uh, to any debt. And if you are experiencing devaluation of the currency of, let's say, 7% a year to pick a number out of the air, uh, maybe the real number's higher. Why would you lend out money at three percent? You're you're marching backwards. You have to have to have to raise rates just to make lending make sense at all. Yeah, it's not really to fight inflation, but it's to attach some of that risk premium because our currency has been devalued. Where do you see rates actually headed in the marketplace? Not not what the Fed says, but where do you think the marketplace is going to uh, set the rates? You know, that, that's been a, a tough thing, um, especially, I mean, last week alone, I mean, we've been trying to keep our finger on, on the pulse of this as we're bidding on multiple deals, but we've had, you know, a number of, of lenders, you know, and some of our preferred lenders who've, who've backed out of the market, um, waiting for the Fed to, to peg the index because they're having a hard time quoting spreads just so they can make money depending on where the index moves. Uh, so it's, it's going to be very tough here in the near future. The answer is I, I really don't know, but we're trying to be as conservative as we can, especially uh, value add, again, is usually executed with bridge debt, trying to cover your, your capital expenditures with the cheapest capital you can, which is usually the senior note, um, as opposed to funding it with more expensive equity. But with that comes, you know, you got to exit that debt at some time, um, and you need to project some sort of refinance or sale um, or something that's going to give you a little more runway. Uh, where we spent the last, you know, probably 24 months, debt's been kind of priced out at, at LTV um, because the debt's been so cheap to service. But I think going forward, there needs to be, you know, a little more focus on on the DSCR. I think uh, the constraints on DSCR is really just going to be sizing loans in the future. And if you're projecting any sort of refinance in your model, um, I don't think you can just assume, hey, I'm going to get 75% loan to value. You need to have serious consideration of what is the cost of services debt? What is the DSCR going to be? And will the lender lend at the leverage I think they're going to? So, you know, every day we we get up, we pull uh, off of Chatham Financial's website, the forward rate curve, and see what they're projecting the rates to be um, at our time of refinancing and, you know, adding 10 basis points and then backing into the DSCR to size any sort of refi. Makes a lot of sense. Well, Ryan, fascinating conversation. If folks want to connect, if they want to learn more, what's the best way? Yeah, the best place uh, is really go to our website at uh, equityyieldgroup.com. Um, you, know, you can sign up for our newsletter, keep up to date with uh, what we've got going on and uh, you know our view of what's happening in the uh, you know, multifamily investment space. Well, Ryan, fascinating conversation. For the listeners at home, definitely connect with Ryan at equityyieldgroup.com. The link is in the show notes. And in the meantime, have an awesome rest of your weekend. Go make some great things happen. I'll talk to you again tomorrow. 